evening and welcome to our annual Lead Generation Youth Summit here at Falls Baptist Church and Baptist College of Ministry. And we are just so thrilled that you've come. I know many more are still coming on in, so uh, we'll make a place for them here this evening as well. But uh, thank you for getting here. And we're anticipating God's working in our midst. Tonight we're going to be, in our song service, be focusing on the fact that God's love is uh, a wonderful and powerful motivation for our Christian lives. Think about the verse in 2 Corinthians, which talks about how the love of Christ constraineth us. And the song, And Can It Be, is a wonderful song, a song of great encouragement. But the author, Charles Wesley, was a young man who was pursuing God the way he thought you should pursue God. And his pursuit was one of uh, what uh, came out of it. He and his brother John were called Methodists. They were coming up with all these different methods. They were unsaved men pursuing God and they were trying, they even came to the United States as missionaries trying to uh, help to convert the people and, and uh, Charles was so zealous that uh, he turned uh, infant baptism into actual immersion. Made a lot of parents mad I think. But uh, anyway, it just wasn't going well though. He, he came back discouraged to England and he met people, he met some Moravians who loved Jesus and uh, who knew the gospel. And he was gloriously converted as he went to a Bible study and God worked in his life. And what's interesting is, is he talks about the fact that right after that conversion, he wrote a song. And I don't think we know confidently what song he wrote, but you sure wonder if he wrote, and can it be? Long my in prison, spirit lay. Fast bound in sin in nature's night, thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke, the dungeon blazed with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Amen. What a testimony of a man who realized how God had transformed his life. He was a pretty good guy, but uh, he got saved, and he realized that was the key, and he just was overwhelmed with the love of God. He was the same one that could write, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, my great <laughs> Redeemer's praise. So tonight, let's just revel in God's love for us as we sing together, starting with your songbook, please. Your songbook that's in front of you there. Number 84 in your songbook, And Can It Be That I Should Gain an Interest in the Savior's Blood. And I know there's many young people here tonight. And uh, one of the favorite groups, really probably my favorite group to hear sing, other than preachers. <laughs> and there's some here tonight, so go ahead and sing out, guys. Uh, but is, is young people that have a heart that's free. Uh, and tonight you may come in bound and struggling. But let me encourage you. One thing that can help free you is just to start singing and praising the Lord. And even if you're, you feel bound up, just let God's love pour over you while you sing. And let God work in your heart tonight as we begin this service. And can it be? Let's stand together, please.
culture, I think that one word that actually describes a lot of young people, a lot of adults actually in today's world, is the word guilt. Right? We just guilty. So many temptations come our way, right? More than probably, well, at least in the many, many years with all the technology, it's, it's a remarkable what our, all of us face. But folks, in Christ, you're not condemned. Amen. No condemnation now yes. I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine, alive in him. So if you're struggling tonight, you know the Lord is Savior, there's a pathway to getting back to who you actually are. And that's what we'll be looking at this week. So when we sing No Condemnation, can I just encourage you, no matter how guilty you feel tonight, if you know the Lord is Savior, if you're saved, that is who you are. Yes, All right? So let's sing it from that position here tonight. On the last. No shouldn't do this, but I can't resist. Welcome to the The Generation Youth Summit. My name is Bobby Bosler, and I'm speaking to you from Menominee Falls, Wisconsin. We want to welcome each one of you to our 2023, our ninth annual The Generation Youth Summit, and we're very excited about the things that we have, that the Lord has in store for us here this week. I think most of us here in this room are familiar with this little phrase, total surrender to God and total dependence on his power to reach the world with the gospel of Christ. Who's heard that before? Okay, I think many of you have. I want to say a couple things about that briefly. Our surrender is not primarily to a cause. Our dependence is not primarily upon a power. This motto of total surrender and total dependence is more than a tagline. It's more than a creed. It's more than a battle cry. It's an expression of a real relationship with Jesus. You know, young people, adults, parents, our desire here this year is to bring each one of you face to face with the unconditional love of your Savior Jesus and thus to evoke the response of total devotion. We're glad you're here. Thanks for joining us this year. And it is a joy to have you here, and let's ask God to do something very special in these days. Lord, we come to you now. We're asking for your presence to be here upon this place. Lord, I think of these precious lives that are here, and oh, how much you love each one of these teens, and what you have planned for them is beyond even our understanding. And Lord, we ask that your will in all of our lives will be accomplished and that Satan would be uh, just overcome, even right from the beginning. And Lord, work in hearts a deep work, we pray. Lord, thank you just for the fellowship and all that we have. The Lord, would it be more than that? Would you do a great work, we pray now in Jesus' name. Amen.
That song describes the journey of those who many times get discouraged in their walk with the Lord. Think of a man named Frederick Lehman, who was a German immigrant, came over as a four-year-old young boy to the U.S. from Germany, and he ended up getting saved at the age of 11 and got involved in ministry. He was serving the Lord and was uh, actually a songwriter as well. He was encouraged in that. And then he fell in some hard times. I think he'd also, in the middle of doing that, started a business. I'm not quite sure this whole background story, but he ended up in 1917 being over in Pasadena, California, and he wasn't at that point in vocational ministry at all, and he was basically moving, uh, responsible for, for helping to move about 30 tons each day of crates of citrus fruit, and that's what he was basically at that moment relegated to, and he was discouraged, and one day he came in, and the Lord was already working in his heart, and he began to, um, he sat down when he had a break and grabbed a crate. Uh, for that the oranges went in, I believe, and he just he grabbed a, a utensil and started to write, and he started to write the words to, the love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches deep where sinners dwell. And it goes on, and that last verse he did not write. It was something that came to his mind. He had heard in a sermon earlier and then found out that it had been found by a man who had written it in a prison cell, actually, but it wasn't from him. It was from eight, nine hundred years before that. So about a thousand year old uh, verse, that last verse is actually, that's why it uses some of the old language there, about uh, could we with ink the ocean fill and were the skies of parchment made, were every stalk on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry. That's why you heard the song, God's love is more. All right? It's boundless. That's why Paul prayed in Ephesians chapter 3 that the believers would know the height, depth, length, breadth of the love of Christ. That's what we want you to know this week. That's our heart cry for you, that you would genuinely know how much God loves you and how much he's provided for you. So let's take our psalm books again and turn to number two tonight. Number two, the love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. Let's go ahead and stand again, please, as we sing this number two.
Thank you. You may be seated. Um, this is because it's also our Wednesday night service tonight. We're just going to take a quick church family moment. And uh, if you did, did not get a prayer bulletin, church family, when you came in, I know we have many guests throughout here, but if you need one, please raise your hand and the ushers will be glad to get that to you tonight. So don't be bashful. And if you're down the middle of a row or something tonight, they'll be glad to put that in your hands this evening. Uh, and so uh, I won't say anything about the prayer bulletin. You've had it sent to your email the last hour and also handed to you now. So I trust that you'll take that this week. Be praying for the requests that are mentioned there. Pastor. Well, it's a great privilege and joy for us to have each of you teenagers here, and we're glad that you brought your sponsors with you. Uh, we're glad to have them also, uh, but it is a great uh, joy to have young people to have a desire to be in uh, days like this. They'll be exciting, they'll be thrilling, and they will be challenging. And I'm thankful for your hearts, and we're looking forward to a great time together. It is our uh, privilege to be able to do this. I appreciate so much. Uh, the generation and all the work that they have put into making this possible. And uh, it's a, a great blessing to have each of you here. Now, let me just mention for our church family that tomorrow night, 7 o'clock again, we'll be having another service just like this. And also on Friday night, uh, tomorrow night, Evangelist Caleb Reed will be the preacher. And then on Friday night, Evangelist Bobby Bosler will be the preacher. So I encourage you to be here and uh, support these meetings, and we're just asking God to work in all of our hearts along with uh, the young people, and uh, these messages be geared for every one of us. Pray during the day, a lot of things going on, and uh, it's going to be an exciting time, and uh, there will not be a dull moment uh, in the next two days. <laughs> it will really go, and uh, so uh, if you have any needs at all, please let us know. Staff here would be more than glad to do anything to solve any problems that may come up. And we want you to have a great time. And uh, don't, we don't want any hiccups along the way. So anything we can do to help you, uh, that would be great. All right. Now for some details. Welcome to the V Generation Youth Summit. We're glad you made it. My name is Dan. I'm Terry Lena. We know that coming to a new environment and meeting a lot of new people can be stressful. So we, the announcement people, are here to help. Tonight we want to start by sparing you from those very awkward, that guy moments. Let's start with registration. So here at TGYS, everyone registers. If you don't register, it's like, like you aren't even here. It's bad. So maybe you just had to slip into the service. We know it wasn't your fault. We heard how that guy missed his alarm and made everybody late. <laughs> Either way, if you had to slip in tonight without registering, try not to slip out without registering too. Because if you don't register, you'd be like the only one who didn't register. <laughs> Awkward. When you registered, you received a notebook. Write your name on it. Don't be the guy asking everybody else. Hey, is that my notebook? Is that my book? Thank you. At registration, you also received two t-shirts. They are going to look great on you. We are here to help you wear the right shirt on the right day. Cause see here at TGYS, Everyone matches. It would be so awkward to be that guy wearing the wrong t-shirt on the wrong day. So tomorrow, wear this shirt. Got it? Oh, and speaking of dress, for Thursday and Friday evening service, you'll want to bring a change of clothes because at service time, everyone will have switched to service attire. After the service tonight, to avoid being the guy who was missing out, you want to head to the fellowship halls at the opposite end of the building for important team meetings, as well as a great snack. Everyone is going to be there. You'll also want to be there so you aren't the guy here all night. Like, all night. <laughs> Who 
hosts and registrants who have yet to connect will do so directly after the service, right by those two big pianos. And here is your last awkwardness avoidance warning. All seniors will understand this one. Imagine being the only 12th and on upgrader in a room full of 9th through 11th graders. I can't even imagine. Yeah, we'd hate for you to be that guy. So all seniors and above will want to remember the experience BCM Supper in the Music Hall Friday evening during the normal supper hour. You can thank us later. There are a few other ways we announcement people would like to help. If you are wanting some more BCM gear to go along with your great new BCM t-shirt, stop by the displays in the lobby to make your purchase. There are items there to accessorize and winterize your TGYS wear. The bookstore will also be open before and after each evening service. We are glad you're here. We know there is a lot to take in. Just do your best to not be that guy. And remember, we're here to help. All right. Well, I hope that answers some of your questions. At this time, we're going to be taking an offering as we will each of the three nights, and uh, the offering will go toward the expenses of this Youth Summit, and uh, we appreciate, obviously, the registration that you've given and all, but if you uh, are burdened to help out with the cost of this, it certainly would be a blessing. So everything, uh, unless it's otherwise designated, will go toward the expenses of this Youth Summit. So ushers, if you'll come. Let's stand for a word of prayer and let's ask God's blessing here on the offering. Lord, thank you for um, this time in which we can get apart from the other distractions of life and be able to hear from you. I pray that tonight you will work in a definite way and uh, open our hearts now. Lord, I do pray you'll meet the uh, needs of this conference. Thank you for uh, just the way you've done that year after year. And I pray you'll bless this offering now for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Over four years ago at our Manifest Presence Victory Conference, the song uh, When He Is Near was written for that conference, and it ties in beautifully the picture of the, of, well, not the picture, the rally of the presence of God in our lives and the, His love. And He is here, my Lord is near, His presence real, His touch I feel, His voice I hear, His love shines in, all doubts disappear. 
I live again when he is near. So take your psalm books and turn to 175. And I'd like for us to sing this here together tonight. It has a wonderful progression, very picturesque song, really pointing to the glorious reality that can be for every one of you here tonight, experiencing God's, the reality of his presence, his love in your life every moment, every day, if you will let him do that. Let's stand again, please, as we sing 175. Let our banner be unfurled. We've a 
story to give to the nations, to bring them the message of salvation. We'll work and watch and fight and pray, O men of God, arise. Men of God, arise, for he comes to claim his children. Men of God, arise, for he cometh in the sky. We know not the day nor hour that he'll come in glorious power. We must go and spread the news that he will come again. We are called to spread the gospel story to those who never heard. We are called to spread the gospel story, let our banner be unfurled. We'll tell a wonderful story of the Christ who sets men free. Men of God, arise and proclaim liberty. Okay, Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5. Good to look out here and see a lot of familiar faces. I'm just curious a little bit about the audience while you're turning to Matthew chapter 5. Uh, for all of you that are young people, how many of you, uh, your educational situation is you're in a public school. Can I see your hands please? Public school. Okay, do we have any public school students? Okay, we got a few. Okay, great. There's our missionaries right there. Okay, and uh, how many are in a Christian school? In a Christian school, okay, several in a Christian school. And then famous home, uh, how do I say it, coast to coast, the homeschool right here. Here they are. Okay, the homeschoolers. Okay, they're the mission field. Okay, <laughs> I'm just teasing. Okay, uh, but anyway, so uh, great to see each one of you. Glad you're here. I'm just curious also what state you're from. Uh, no, I'm not talking about discouragement. I'm talking about, well, if you're from Illinois, maybe you are. But anyway, um, uh, how many are from the state of Illinois? Speaking of Illinois, okay. Boy, that's unbelievable. So people are excited about living in Illinois. Can you believe that? Okay, unbelievable. Good job. I appreciate that. I grew up in Chicago. So uh, if you're one from them, uh, you can kind of, you know, have fun with it. It's like, I'm a Cubs fan. Uh, I can make fun of the Cubs, but don't dare you if you're not a Cubs fan. But anyway, uh, how it goes. How many of you guys are Cubs fans down here? Okay, good. How many are Sox fans? How many could care less? Okay, there it is. Okay, but anyway, there's our Chicago people. Uh, Illinois people, that is. Belvedere, well, that's Chicago, even though you don't admit it. Okay, but anyway, uh, Chicago suburb it used to be uh, far away, but not anymore. But uh, okay, and then uh, Iowa. How many are from the state of Iowa? Okay, there they are. Got some Iowa people. Okay, good. And how many are from uh, the state of Indiana? Anybody from Indiana? Got some from Indiana. Great. Anybody from Michigan? Michigan. I don't know if I saw any Michiganders, but okay. And uh, Minnesota. Minnesota. Did I say it right? Yeah. Okay. I want to make sure I say that right. Uh, now, I got all the states that surround Wisconsin. I know we have some Floridians here. Okay. Uh, there are uh, Florida people raise their hand. Okay. So, these folks, how, how hot was it when you left? 90 degrees? 80s? Okay. More? Less? Oh, so it was uh, got a cold wave down there. Okay. But anyway, I just came from California two days ago. I was at 100 degrees. Okay. So uh, uh, temperatures, and then it finally dropped up uh, even down there. Any other state I'm missing? I'm not uh, uh, just curious. Okay. Okay. Got a few. Okay. So Ohio. Where's Ohio? Ohio. Right there. Okay. That's why we missed them. Okay. Okay. And then Kentucky. Kentucky. Anybody in Kentucky? No, Kentucky. And who was over here? South Carolina. How can I forget South Carolina? My grandson's from South Carolina. Okay. Okay. So South Carolina. Let's have South, hear it for South Carolina over here. Okay. Okay. That's another state I've lived in in my uh, short life. Okay. By Michigan, Colorado, and uh, Illinois, most in Illinois growing up anyway, and uh, Wisconsin as well as South Carolina. So I've been around. Of course, I've been in traveling for several years, and uh, I think we are have preached in 40, uh, 47 of the 50 states. So still got Alaska and Hawaii. So if you know anybody, just have them. They'd be glad. I'd be glad to go whenever I get a chance. Just make sure Alaska's in the summer. Okay, but. Um, but it is a delight for you to be here, and we are certainly uh, trusting that God will encourage your heart, meet with us, 
And uh, I know the Lord wants to do something in your heart, no doubt about it. I, I, let me just ask this. How many are sponsors, moms and dads? In other words, you facilitated a group being here. Can I see your hands, please? You were part of getting them here, organizing, etc. Couldn't do it without you. Thank you so much for coming. There'll be some things as well this week. Well, there's some things that I am excited about this week. Of course, one of them uh, relates to my son-in-law, and uh, you'll be hearing from him and he's got an app that he'll be launching. And I, of course, some of you that may have listened to the podcast, I kind of went over a little bit of that journey and the excitement about that app coming out that is a part of uh, the purity journey that I believe many people are on. And uh, as well as the app coming out here in uh, 2024, we're going to have the Renew Series. How many are familiar with the Renew Series? Anybody all familiar with that? Okay, very excited about that. You'll hear a little bit more about that this week as well. We're very uh, encouraged what God is doing there and raising up particularly young men who are leading that purity movement, and Renew is a part of that. And so a lot of good things happening. We're encouraged about that. So you're, we're glad you're here, and I trust that you'll be able to take some things home that will be an encouragement and help in your walk with God. I'm just curious how many of you have at least one time listened to a The Generation podcast. Can I see your hands, please? Okay, I know I'm asking a lot. That's encouraging. I'm glad you do. Uh, there's some wonderful podcasts. I won't go into them all. But I was looking at the speaker lineup, and I think there's a historic moment uh, in this particular uh, The Generation. Uh, everybody is tied uh, to Minutemen Ministries in the generation that is speaking. Every single speaker is. Um, four of the speakers have traveled on the Minutemen Evangelistic team. And so it's kind of neat to have uh, three, of course, that have traveled with me are, tra are speaking, Brother Bosler and Brother Reed, and as well as Brother Mueller. And so excited about their preaching. And of course, Brother Bosler now leads the team himself. And so, and Brother Reed and Brother Mueller are uh, in those early steps of launching out into evangelism, which is excited about that. So it's really exciting to have them here. Of course, Brother Mark Gilmore uh, is uh, one of the ones that has the regular podcast every month, Go Mission. And if you have a heart for missions, you need to listen to that. It'll stir your heart about what God is doing worldwide. So just, I know I've said a lot of things here, but just uh, thrilling to have you here and trusting this will be an encouragement. Well, I want us to go to Matthew 5, and I want to read just about, I think, three verses of Scripture and I want to just, uh, just point out something here that this will be a theme I'll bring back uh, in my own preaching. It may come up in other messages as well. Something that has really been stirring my heart recently. In fact, I preach a message, Do You Know Who You Are? And this uh, particular text of Scripture has a little bit of that truth in it. I want to kind of point that out here in a moment. Uh, and uh, so let's read those texts. Now remember, this is from the Sermon on the Mount. So Jesus is preaching this outside. And he's preaching it on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. Twice I've been to kind of a natural amphitheater there. The scholars believe that's very well could have been the place Jesus preached this. Thousands of people were expecting Jesus to announce a political revolution, but he didn't. He announced a spiritual revolution, which continues to this very moment. Amen. And he addressed those that are in his kingdom. He addressed those that are believers. And he says, there's two things you need to understand about who you are. So let's look at verse number 13. He says, ye are the salt of the earth. And I want you to see verse number 14. Ye are the light of the world. Now, I'm going to come back and read those verses, but I want you to note something. Notice what he said. He didn't say, you should be the salt of the earth. He didn't say, you should be the light of the world. Now, if I can say this carefully, and I'm not sure, certainly not trying to throw other preachers under the bus because any of us who've preached very long regret some of the things we've said earlier in our ministry, no doubt about it. But the Bible doesn't say that. I've heard this verse preached that way. You need to be the salt of the earth. You need to be the light of the world. But that's not what it says. It says that's who you are. If you're saved, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. We'll say, preacher, I'm not doing a very good job lighting the world, and I'm certainly not doing a very good job salting the earth. Well, the point is, not that you need to try to do something that God is telling you to do. No, you need to recognize that's who you are. And in recognizing it, friends, that's how you get to victory. In other words, as I've said before, it's not do and you'll be. He's not saying do this and you'll become the salt of the earth. You'll become the light of the world. He's not saying do and you'll be. He's saying because you are, do. That's who you are. If you're saved in this room, I'm telling you right now, Jesus is telling you, you're the salt of the earth. That's who you are. You are the light of the world. And the reason you are those things is because Jesus lives in you and he real, does a real good job at salting the earth and he does a real good job of lighting up the world. <laughs> And he's in you. 
That's who you are. Many young people define themselves by their failures. They define themselves by things that have been done against them. They define themselves by their past. Instead of defining themselves by who God or Jesus says who they are because they're in union with him. Now we may, I, last year I dealt with that some. I don't know how the Lord will lead fully this year, but I felt led to go ahead and start with this text. This is who God says you are. So we're going to just look at those two things. We'll read the verses in a moment. But I want you to see, first of all, you're the salt of the earth. And secondly, you're the light of the world. Two-point message. And I'm going to give you the two points ahead of time for underneath each point. The first one is function. Okay. He's asked us to be salt. What does that look like? He's saying, uh, not ask us to be, he's saying that we are salt. What does that look like? He's saying you're light. What does that look like? So I want us to see what it looks like, first of all, so we might say function. And then the second point is failure. What happens when we do not live because who we are? We don't live who we are. It's interesting in Romans 12 too, he says, be not conformed to this world. Conformity is being on the outside what you're not on the inside. He said, you're saved, blood bought on your way to heaven. Why would you want to show your affinity and, and, and uh, uh, alignment with the world? And that's not who you are on the inside. Don't do that. See, what he's saying here is, don't you get this? Inside, you're the salt of the earth. That's who you are. Inside, you're the light of the world. And when you don't function to do that, you're not being who you are. You're being conformed to something that's not who you are. So we're going to look at the function, then we'll look at what happens when we fail to be who God says we are. So first of all, let's read verse 13. It says, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt hath lost his savor, wherewith shall it, that's the earth, obviously, be salted? It, the salt, is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. So many different directions you could go on a message like this. But let's just talk about salt for a moment. Uh, we certainly use salt in our culture, and of course, ancient cultures, uh, salt was used. In fact, I understand it was even used as currency, had great value. And that's where that little phrase, you're not worth your salt, came from. And of course, salt today uh, uh, still is used, mostly on the table. And up north, it's even used on the roads, unbelievable, yeah. Uh, so, as Florida people, I have to educate them. We put salt on our roads up north, not just on our food, okay. But... Uh, the salt of the earth. A lot of things we could say about salt, but let me just give you a couple of things about salt. We could really preach all week long on what is salt. But one thing that's very clear about salt is salt intensifies thirst. Salt intensifies thirst. It creates and it intensifies thirst. Hey, you ever gone to bed after maybe eating at a Mongolian grill? And of course, if you're somebody like Pastor Gilmore, you're going to have about fourths at a Mongolian grill. He cannot eat me at a Mongolian grill. But anyway, you know, but they put soy sauces and all kinds of sauces on it. A lot of those sauces are filled with salt. You ever woke up about three in the morning dying of thirst? Yeah, you know why? That's what salt did. It just created and intensified thirst. We all know on a hot summer day, you don't take a bag of chips and eat those on a hot summer day without some kind of beverage. Why? Because salt will create and intensify thirst. We all kind of understand that's what salt does. It was in the Northern African theater of war in World War II, there was a group of German soldiers that ran out of the most precious commodity. It was not um, ammunition, it was water. Now, most of us know that Northern Africa is not, air, uh, is not lush jungle, it is arid desert. And those German soldiers knew that if they did not get water and get it soon, they wouldn't die of enemy bullets, they would die of thirst. So they began to move, at, particularly at night. They would move very fast at night because obviously they wouldn't sweat as much at night. And they were moving across the desert trying to get to Alexandria, Egypt because it was in the hands of the Germans at the time. And they knew they could resupply their water. But as they began to traverse the desert, of course, they began to dehydrate. There came a point where literally there was no saliva left in their mouths. It's hard to imagine sticking your finger in your mouth and pulling it out and completely being dry, but that's the condition they were in. Of course, your inside of your mouth, your tongue begin to, uh, begins to get chapped, and as they were going across the desert, they began to get in that agony of dehydration. When they did, they came across a big, huge pipeline that the British had built to transport fresh water from one place to another in wartime. Of course, the German soldiers were delighted. They got out their machine guns and they riddled that pipeline full of machine gun holes and every bullet hole became a water fountain. Crazed with thirst, the German soldiers ran up to that water, pouring out of the pipeline, began to pour it down their throats. But the damage was done before they realized it was not fresh water, it was Mediterranean seawater. See, the Brits had built the pipeline, wanted to test it, but they didn't want to use fresh water because it's so precious in the desert to test it for leaks. So they decided to use seawater. 
at that very moment when the Germans ingested that. Now, if you know anything about seawater, and perhaps you don't, I wouldn't have known this in the upper Midwest, but if you ingest seawater, you, you intensify your thirst seven times. So now, now the Germans realize they probably were going to die. They spent a night in unutterable suffering, suffering like none, none of us in this room probably ever experienced. As they were going across the desert at night, as the day began to dawn, somehow they happened upon a small group of British soldiers. The British were outmanned. They were outgunned. They had, the Germans had more armor. They had more uh, men. They had more ammunition, more guns, everything. And they began a skirmish out there in the desert. And just when it seemed like the Germans were going to pound through the meager British lines, to the amazement of the Brits, German soldiers began running out of their ranks with their hands held high. But they did not wait for the formalities of surrender. Oh, no. They ran into the ranks of the British, began pulling canteens off the necks and hips of the British soldiers, pouring the precious water down their throats. They were willing to surrender anything and everything. You know why? Salt. Salt had done its job. Do you know, my friend, inside of you, you see, maybe I put this, God has created you to make other people thirsty for what God can do in a totally surrendered life and a totally dependent life. You see, it's like this, friends. When you allow the Lord Jesus to be seen through your life, it makes other people thirsty for what God can do in a life that's totally sold out to Him and totally depending on Him. And I will tell you, I don't see a lot of teenagers who are living that way, but a man, occasionally I come across teenagers who are walking with Jesus, allowing his life to flow through them. And you know what happens? It makes other people thirsty for a life lived that way. See? See, God's called you to be salt. You know why? Because that's who you are. And you say, well, preacher, I can't make people thirsty for Jesus. Well, no, I agree with you. You in and of yourself can't, but Jesus can't. <laughs> When he's living his life through you, it makes people thirsty. I remember years ago, just meeting a young man, and he was the center on the high school basketball team at his Christian school. And one day, another team member on that basketball team pulled out a piece of paper and wrote him a note. Dear David, I want to know God like you know God. You know what that teenager was doing? He was allowing the Lord Jesus to live through his life, making other young people thirsty for what God could do in a surrendered life. Yeah. Well, I'm telling you, friends, I've seen teenagers single-handedly impact their Christian school. You know why? Because the life of Jesus was evident. I remember years ago, I was down in South Carolina, and I remember a young lady came up to the microphone in Christian school, probably 100 students, the 7th and 12th, and, and she gave a very unusual testimony. She said, you know, about three weeks ago, she said, I got a hunger for God I've never had in my entire life. She said, this week, I got into this week, and she said, uh, God showed me some things that were hindering my walk with God and some of them were like music, worldly music and she said I've dealt with these things and, and she gave a wonderful testimony of that week just getting right with God, dealing with things between her and God. She had a thirst for a relationship with God like she never had. I just remembered it because it's so unusual to have somebody three weeks before God begin that prep work. And, and that certainly was an encouragement to pray that way. Uh, but anyway, about six months later, I saw a youth pastor at a youth conference. And I said, hey, how's it going at the school? He said, man, do you remember that girl? And he gave me enough details. I remembered her testimony. He said, that girl is single-handedly impacting our Christian school. Everybody knows she's changed for good. She's not going back. And every day she walks into the Christian school, she so exudes the reality of Jesus and the joy of the Lord, she is single-handedly impacting our Christian school. You know what was happening? Jesus was showing up at that Christian school. <laughs> she wasn't making people in and of herself thirsty for Jesus, but Jesus through her was making people thirsty. And that Christian school had some sustained reviving work as a result of a young lady who got all of the fact that she's the salt of the earth. And friends, when you're in line with the fact the Lord Jesus lives in you, other people get thirsty for what God can do in a life that's so totally surrendered. I find that in my own life. You get around people who are walking with Jesus, it gets you thirsty for Jesus, doesn't it? Gets thirsty for a life that's content, a life that has peace, a life that has fulfillment, a life that has joy. Hey, listen, every single one of you kids that are sneaking junk on the Internet, every one of you kids that are looking at YouTube videos your parents won't want you to look at, every one of you are sneaking Hollywood movies you know that grieve the Holy Spirit, every one of you, you don't have peace, you don't have fulfillment, you don't have satisfaction. Somehow you think the world's got something up on Jesus. And you feel like you're missing out because Hollywood somehow has a better life than Jesus does. And I'll tell you what your youth group needs is a young person who loves Jesus, walking with Jesus, living the reality of the salt of the earth, and making people thirsty for what God can do in a totally surrendered life. Yeah. 
then you realize Hollywood's got nothing up on the Holy Word. <laughs> yeah. Walking with Jesus is the reality. So, the so salt of the earth, God is saying, that's who, that's who you are. You're the salt of the earth. I live in you. You are, you make me, if you just let my life live through you, you're going to make people thirsty for me. Yeah, wow. Salt of the earth. But God also says, uh, well, another aspect of salt is something else. Salt stays or salt holds back corruption. I, uh, I'm sure every one of you uh, has had this happen in circumstances maybe different, but I remember back in, when I was in high school, we'd have two-a-days to get ready for the soccer season. Anybody know what two-a-days are from your old high school career? Yeah, two-a-days. They had to do football, uh, soccer, and things. Practice in the morning, practice in the afternoon. And, and uh, you know, for a while, all you're doing is just exercising, doing some drills. But the day comes when you get the scrimmage. You know what I'm talking about? And, boy, when you get a scrimmage, you want your spot on that squad. You want to get that starting lineup. And so, of course, you're going to give it all you've got. And, of course, it's about 90 degrees, even in those early day I mean, in those days in Illinois at the end in August there'd be some hot days and it'd be out there and you'd be sweating and you're trying to earn a spot on that team and maybe you get beat some uh, some guy dribbles by you and you got to impress the coach so you decide to go after him and try to pull off a slide tackle where you slide and pull that got to get the ball first okay and you got to pull that ball right off his feet you want to get that you want to get that spot and so you know how it is back in the early days of the Christian school grass what's that we didn't have fields that had grass okay you know what I'm talking about they just got any field back I'll be honest with you our practice field at Marquette Manor was a driving range you know, I had to watch. Is anybody, is anybody driving the balls? Yeah, watch out. Somebody's driving golf balls. I'm telling you the honest truth. We practiced on a driving range. Yeah. And I'm telling you, there wasn't always a lot of grass where it is, but you know how it is. You lay out on that slide tackle trying to impress the coach, and you get up, and you have what they call a strawberry. I don't know why they call them strawberries. You know, they got dirt, gravel in them, you know, wounds like that. They look more like you know, sausage pizza to me. But anyway, uh, they call them strawberries, but takes a layer of skin off. But you know how it is, guys. I don't know how the girls are, but I know the guys. You're just tough. You know how it is. We're going to keep playing. And you keep playing, and you're sweating, and that sweat rolls down into that strawberry, and guess what happens? It stings. See, that's what salt does. Salt holds back corruption. You know, my dad lived just a few blocks from the Atlantic Ocean, Biscayne Bay there in Miami, and I remember him telling me when he was a kid, he'd get a cold. He never had a cold long. He said he'd run down to the ocean. He'd jump in the ocean, do a somersault underneath. And when you did, all the salt water would come in your nasal cavity. And just when you got up, well, it wasn't a pretty sight, but you didn't have a cold anymore. <laughs> <laughs> kind of clean you out. Kids, you ever have your mom give you a little, little bottle, a spray bottle, and it says saline solution, you know? That's salt. You know what salt does? It stays. It holds back corruption. How many have heard of the brain-eating amoeba some people have gotten down in fresh water? I think uh, Nebraska, different states. You know, it doesn't happen very often. But they say something about that brain-eating amoeba. It's never in salt water. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Salt stays, holds back corruption. It protects. It's, it's an, and we all understand that. In fact, some pools no longer are chlorinated. They've learned how to just turn them into salt water, turn them into the ocean. Okay? So, salt is a, just, a, we all understand, it's a kind of a healing compound. And it's been used for literally centuries, millennia, we could say. So, when Jesus says, you're the salt of the earth, you know what he's saying? When you are walking with Jesus, you know what happens? You don't even realize it. You hold back corruption. <laughs> Somebody's telling a dirty joke in the locker room and you walk in, they stop telling a dirty joke. You know why? Oh, here's a kid loves Jesus. We better be careful. He loves Jesus. He's loyal to Jesus. We better be careful what we're talking about. Yeah. See, salt holds back corruption. And I'll tell you, friends, salt is a wonderful thing because it not only holds back corruption, it, it is uh, that which uh, obviously convicts about the corruption. <laughs> Some of you well know that uh, Mickey Mantle was... Uh, a great player, of course, for the New York Yankees. For all of you, that, how many baseball fans we have? I know you're probably going to all have gray hair. But anyway, yeah, okay, got a few younger ones. Good, okay, baseball fans. But Mickey Mantle played hard, and unfortunately, he lived hard. And he drank himself into an early grave. And when Mickey Mantle was dying a premature death of liver disease, as I understand it, of all the New York Yankees, do you know who he called to his bedside? A second baseman, a short guy, a guy by the name of Bobby Richardson, Bobby Richardson, he's still living, as I understand, lives in Sumter, South Carolina. Uh, but um, 
Bobby Richardson uh, is the only player in all of Major League history to get an MVP in the World Series on the losing team in 1960. That was the shot around the world, Bill Mazeroski. How many know what I'm talking about? Yeah, these are real hardcore baseball fans right there. Yeah, okay, the shot around the world. Okay, but anyway, in that World Series, I believe it was, he, he got the MVP. But it's said that one day, as Bobby Richardson, he was a short guy, kind of like Jose Altuve would be today, a short baseball player. Of course, they're all muscle-bound. But uh, one day, the big first placement, I can't remember his name, for the New York Yankees, walked up to Bobby Richardson. Of course, he had a sterling Christian testimony. And they handed him a, he handed him a can of beer and said, Hey, Bobby, drink it up. It'll make you a man. And it said that Bobby Richardson grabbed the can of beer and he threw it across the Yankees locker room. Now, baseball players can throw things hard. <laughs> that can of beer hit the brick wall and they say it exploded, just exploded, just, just slid down the wall. And Bobby Richardson looked up at the big, huge first baseman and says, don't you ever do that to me again. Do you know who Mickey Mantle called to his bedside as he was stepping into eternity? Bobby Richardson. And you know what Bobby Richardson did? He led Mickey Mantle to Jesus Christ. And when you get to heaven, you're going to see Mickey Mantle there. Not because he's a good guy. He wasn't a good guy. But because he got to Jesus before he died. Because he had a baseball player on his team who thought it was important to be salt. <laughs> See, salt, salt stays and it holds back corruption. So do you laugh at the dirty joke? Do you smile at the dirty innuendo? Do you try to contribute when somebody's talking about the dirty sitcom? I'm not talking about being tactless. Jesus always is tactful. He'll help you navigate the thing. But I will tell you, when you're walking with Jesus, you will hold back corruption every single time. Now, notice what it says here. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt hath lost its savor. Okay, so God tells us there's the possibility of failure here to not be who God says you are. How do you do that? You lose your savor. Well, you say, preacher, how? Okay, this is figurative speaking. How, how do you do that? Well, the Greek word here is very picturesque. It actually is a verb, but it comes from a noun, and the noun is all throughout the Bible. In fact, in the Greek New Testament, it's, uh, it's, I'll, I'll, I'll spell the Greek word for you because we get an English word from it. Here it is, M-O-R-O-S, mor moros. Just drop kick the S, put on an N, you've got the word, moros. You say, preacher, I know, I'm sitting next to one. Okay, don't point fingers. Okay, but anyway, yeah, moros. Okay, moros is translated in the Bible, fool. Makes a lot of sense, does it? And this particular word, lose its savor, means, don't miss this, play the part of of a fool. So Christian teenager, do you know how you play the you know, how you lose your savior? Do you know how you play the part of a fool? And that is simply the book of Proverbs tells us all kinds of ways you can play the part of a fool. And when you play the part of a fool, you lose the effectiveness who, of who you really are. You cloud the testimony of Jesus Christ. And the fact that he wants to live through you to make people thirsty for Jesus and to stay and hold back corruption. And here you are, losing your effectiveness because you're playing the part of a fool. Now, we could spend the rest of this, the generation you summit, talking about the fool. But let me just give you two tonight, real quickly, because there are often ones young people struggle with. How about Proverbs 1 7? Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Can I say this about fools? Fools hate rules. Listen, if you have some kid come to church, oh, you're not going to believe what my mom and dad said I got to do. That young man's a fool. Right. Right. See, it's God who calls him a fool. See, fools don't like to be told what to do. Fools don't want, uh, like, rules. They don't like inst instruction. And the Bible says they also hate wisdom. You know what fools do? I, I, I work in Christian schools every week. I've been in several Christian schools already this school year. And I will tell you what a fool does. He complains about Bible class. <laughs> oh, we got to have Bible class. Oh, we got to memorize Scripture. What a bummer. Oh, another chapel. Oh, wow, another preaching time. That's a fool. Fools despise wisdom. They despise, and I will just say this, young person, when you come complaining about the rules of wherever you are, you come complaining about your parents, or, or you come complaining about Bible class or Scripture memory or whatever, you're losing your effectiveness as salt. But there's another one. The Bible says fools make a mock at sin in Proverbs 14, 9. So you know what fools do? They laugh about things that are sinful. They think they're funny. Sin's not funny. It puts people in hell, and only a fool would think it would be funny. <laughs> 
You laugh at dirty jokes, you're a fool. I don't care who you are. You tell dirty jokes, you're a fool. I'm talking to fools in this room right now. I'm talking to kids who every day of your life laugh at dirty innuendos or maybe give them yourself just to be cool. And you're a fool. God, you say, preacher, are you calling me a fool? No, I'm not calling you a fool. God already did. I'm just telling you what God says you are. But you start playing the part of a fool, and I will tell you, friends, you lose your effectiveness as salt. You get sarcastic about the teacher or laugh when somebody else is sarcastic about the teacher. I'm telling you, you're playing the part of a fool. <laughs> yeah, fools look at filth on the Internet and then brag to their buddies about the junk they're looking at. That's what fools do. You say, ah, oh, come on, preacher, is it really that big a de idea? Yeah, a big deal? Yeah, it's a big deal. I remember years ago in the 1980s, I was at the Bill Rice Ranch. A man by the name of Bob Kelly was preaching. They nicknamed him Machine Gun Kelly. And if you ever get a chance to listen to a recording of his message, one of his messages, I would thoroughly encourage you to do it. But Bob Kelly was preaching, and I remember as he was preaching, he gave a personal testimony. I've never forgotten it. He described himself as high school. This is his own description, so please don't get offended by it. He said this. He said, I was a hellbound, roughneck football player from the other side of the tracks. That was his description. He said, I knew the gospel, but he said, I wasn't saved and knew it. He said, on my football team, he said, there were two young men whose fathers were gospel preachers. He said, our football team was pretty good. He said, for two years straight, we won the Tennessee State Championship, went down to Jacksonville, Florida to play, play Robert E. Lee High School in a regional football championship. He said, on one of those years, he said, a night or two before the football game, the entire team was in, in uh, a hotel room. He said, there were no coaches, there were no cheerleaders, no chaperones, just football players. He said it wasn't long before the talk turned dirty and one dirty joke after another began to fly out of the lips of those football players. He said, here I was, lost and hellbound. He said, my thought was this. I wonder what the preacher's kids are going to do. Their fathers were gospel preachers. He said that night, not only did they laugh, pretty soon they were telling their dirty joke of their two of their own. He said that night, I walked out of that hotel room. I said to myself, if that's Christianity, I don't want any of it. He said, I headed straight out of that room, headed straight to hell. You know why? Because of two young men who were playing the part of a fool. Fortunately, in his, in his public high school, there was a young lady who was doing her job, being in union with Jesus and living the Christ life. And uh, uh, she would come to school every day, and she dressed different. Even in those days, the 50s, she dressed different. Dressed in a way was definitely more, uh, more modest than the girls were dressing. And, and every day she put her Bible unashamedly on top of her books. Her name was Leanne, Leanne Robertson. Some of you will recognize her last name because her father happened to be the pastor of the Highland Park Baptist Church in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And one day Leanne Robertson, doing her job, being in union with Jesus, salt of the earth, said, Bob, why don't you come to church with me tonight? <laughs> Bob Kelly said, I had no romantic interest in her. I came for one reason. She was the real deal. Went to church that night, sat on the second row. And a man by the name of Lester Roloff got up to preach. If there ever was a setup, that was a setup. <laughs> and old Lester Roloff preaches the, preaches the devil out of hell. I mean, I'm telling you, he preached it up one side, down the other. And old Bob Kelly said, the old hound duds of heaven began to nip at his heels. It wasn't long after that he got wondrously born again. Led thousands of people to Jesus Christ before he died. And right now is sitting in heaven. Do you think he would say it was a big deal she was the salt of the earth? Yeah, God's called you to be salt. That's who you are. But he also says, ye are the light of the world. So look at verse 14. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Now what in the world are we talking about here? Well, it's interesting, I remember the two times I've been to this particular spot where they say Jesus preached. It is said that uh, actually there was, a, if you go there, there's a little town up there on the hill. And if you know much about the Sea of Galilee, if you ever go there, it kind of reminds me of a football stadium, a big football stadium. Like there's mountains like a horseshoe around that except for the southern end where the, the Jordan River goes down to the Dead Sea. And, of course, it's deeper, and that's why, they keep, that's why we have the, the, the different stories in the Bible where the, there were storms would come in. It's, it's 14 miles uh, long and 7 miles wide, so it's not a huge body of water. And on that northern shore, there's that, like I mentioned, there's that amphitheater. And remember the guide showing us one day, and he pointed out to a little city. He said, that was there in Jesus' day. Can you see Jesus preaching? You're the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. You can see people turning around looking at the little city. 
What is he talking about? Well, obviously, you know, the light of the world is a little easier than the first one. You know why? Because Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And when you're saved, you're in union with the light of the world. <laughs> you say, I'm not a very good gospel giver. Well, I got really good news. He is. <laughs> That's who you are because you're in union with the light of the world. And God is simply saying, this is who you are. So through your life and through your lips, be who I made you to be. You are the light of the world. Every Christian in this room, Jesus is saying to you, that's who you are. You're the light of the world. And I will tell you, I love to see young people get burdened for lost and for God to use their feeble attempts to bring somebody to Jesus Christ. It's always a thrill. I love it when young people stand to the microphone and uh, give a testimony that impacts. I've seen, I remember years ago I had a kid out in Rutgersville, Virginia get saved. He got saved, I think, on a Wednesday night, on Friday night. Uh, he was just a raw, I mean, just out of the world. He had blonde hair over one eye like this, had a couple of earrings. I mean, he had just gotten saved. He didn't know anything. And, and he got up to give his testimony, told about, he, got, he said, man, I got saved. He said, if you don't get saved, there was a campfire right there. He said, you're going to burn in the fire. He said, you're going to burn forever in the fire. Man, he preached a message. And the whole funny thing was, his blonde hair was flopping back and forth as he uh, went like this. And I thought, I've never seen a preacher with blonde hair over one eye flop back and forth. It's kind of a little, it's kind of neat, but it was just different. <laughs> but you know what he was doing? He'd been saved two days, doing a better job being the light of the world than most young people I know. No one told him to do it. Say, why do you do it? Because that's who he was. He's the light of the world. So let's tell everybody, don't burn in the fire. But he didn't know how to explain it, but he did a good job. You see, that's what Jesus is trying to say to every single one of us through our life and through our lips. We need to spread forth the good news that Jesus saves people from hell. He's the light that pierces the darkness. A lot of people in darkness. There's so much more could be said. I could give illustrations of young people being the light of the world. But for time's sake, let's go to verse number 15 because here we see the failure again. What happens when we don't live in the reality of who we are? We allow Satan to convince us that's not who we are. And so we live in defeat. What happens? Okay, look at verse 15. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel but on a candlestick and it giveth light to all that are in the house. Now you've got to understand a little context here. When I've been to Israel, I've only been a couple of times, but I remember particularly going, I think the first time there, the church hadn't been built over it, but there's the ruins of Peter's wife's mother's house. And I remember being struck with how small the structure was. Smaller than the average motel room or hotel room. And a pretty much common man, other than rich people, they just lived in a house with one room. I mean, think about it. I mean, how many of us could go into our house tonight, turn on one light, and it gives light to everybody in the house? Well, you say, preacher, that can't happen. We, have, we don't have a big house, but we have multiple rooms, right? But this, everybody understood this because they'd walk in, put, a, uh, put an oil lamp up, stick it on the, there'd be a little block that would come out a little, like most of the time, built out a block and they had a little block, they'd stick it on that shelf and it'd give light to all that are in the house because the house was one room. <laughs> That's the picture. And what Jesus is saying is nobody comes and puts that oil lamp on there and then puts a bucket over it. That doesn't make sense. Have you ever done that? Gotten up in the middle of the night, you know, I got to use the restroom, go turn on the restroom lights, then take a thick towel and put it over the lights. You ever done that? You ever couldn't sleep in the middle of the night, so you got up to read a book? This is so 90s, but anyway, got up to read a book, you know what I'm talking about? Got up to read a book, yeah, turn on the lampshade, threw a cover over the lampshade. You say, preacher, why would you turn on the light on and cover it? That's exactly what Jesus is asking you. Why would you be the light of the world and then put a bucket over it so nobody can see it? That doesn't make sense. The greatest news that humankind will ever get that Jesus can keep them out of hell and we keep it to ourselves. That doesn't make sense. Jesus is saying nobody does that in real life. Why do we do it in spiritual life? You see the picture, what he's trying to help us understand? So why do we put a bucket over the light? Light. Well, there's many things we could talk about. Honestly, sometimes it's fear. That'd be another message in and of itself. But I'll tell you what it is many times with young people. It's apathy. Well, where does apathy come from? Well, it actually goes deeper than that. Don't miss this verse. Matthew 24, 12. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. You show me a teenager who is cold to the things of God, and I will show you a teenager that is not just in sin. He's in abounding iniquity. I'll tell you, Mom and Dad, wake up. Your kids don't want to go to church. 
They don't want to read the Bible. They don't want to have anything with, to do with God. I want to tell you something, friends. They don't just have sin. They have abounding sin. Every single time. I've done this thing for 39 years, and I can tell you that we ought to believe it because the book says it, but I believe it because I've seen it. Not only does the Bible say it, but I've seen it. You show me a kid who doesn't like the things of God, I'll show you a kid who's looking at filth in the middle of the night, got a brain full of garbage. I'll show you a kid who's got a heart of hatred, bitterness, unforgiving spirit. It's like this. I say this as carefully as I know how. But I'm, I say this. Some of you young people in this room, your next door neighbor could die and go to hell tonight. It would not bother you five seconds. I'm going to tell you why. Because of the filth you've been looking at for, for months, some of you years. See, that's what sin does. And when you begin to have abounding iniquity in your life, your love for souls, love for God, love for things eternal gets colder and colder and colder and colder. So pretty soon, soon you don't care even if people go to hell. Listen, for some of you in this room that have a heart for souls, you ever hear of a famous person who dies? You know what my, usually my first thought is? Man, they know the truth now. That's tragic. They're burning in hell. What a tragedy. See, friends, with the iniquity abounding, your love for God, love for souls gets cold. I'll give this here and hope it'll just kind of tie things up here tonight. I, 1992, I had a young man travel on my team. His name is Aaron. Aaron now pastors in a Small town, a town he actually grew up in. I would say small, small, but probably 10,000, 20,000, something like that. It's not a huge town. He, um, when he traveled in 1992, every Monday night, which is our final night of our war, he would give his testimony. And I heard it multiple times. So a few years back, I called him up and I said, Aaron, you have a problem if I publicly give your testimony? He said, no, if you can use it, God will use, use it. Hard. I'd be glad for you to tell the story. When Aaron was in, uh, I think it was eighth grade, he went to a Christian school there in his town, very small Christian school, and he got saved. For a while, his life began to change, and there were some good things happening, but unfortunately, his, his school was so small they couldn't have a high school, so this is really before homeschooling was much of an option. So at, when he graduated from eighth grade, he went down the street to the local public school, and he enrolled as a freshman at the public school. He said it didn't take long before he got away from God pretty bad. And he said to became very good friends with an unsaved young man by the name of Jason. He said he and Jason were inseparable friends. The summer following their freshman year, he said, wherever you saw me, he said, you see Jason, wherever you saw Jason, I'd be there as well. We were just inseparable the whole summer long. He said, into our sophomore year, something happened that hurt our friendship. He said, uh, Jason got into the drug culture. He said, although I wasn't right with God, I, I, I wasn't going to go there. He said, we're still good friends, but not the fast friends because he had begun to get more into the drugs and I wasn't going there. He said, it was our junior year, so it had been a year after their friendship got a little bit altered. And he said, I was, uh, was homecoming football night. He played in the defensive secondary. He played either cornerback or safety. And he was sitting on the sideline or standing on the sideline while the offense was out on the field, homecoming night, big night. And he's mostly concentrated on the game. For just a moment, he looked up in the stands, small town, not too hard to scan the stands. And he began to look for his friend, Jason. Couldn't find him. He thought to himself, that's odd. Everybody's here on homecoming night. Wonder why Jason's not. But he soon forgot about it, got back involved in the game and played the game. They won. He was excited, went home, raided the fridge, sat down in front of the television. It wasn't long before there was a knock at his door. When he opened the door, he noticed that the entire front porch was filled with, um, with acquaintances and friends. And nobody was laughing. Nobody was joking. They all looked like they came from a funeral. He invited him to the entry of their house without a, a word, in total silence. He knew something was wrong that came into the entryway of his house. Evidently, there was a spokesman who was appointed. And when everybody was in, he said, Aaron, Jason is dead. Aaron said later, he said, I didn't think they were telling me the truth. I, I, I just didn't believe it. But he said, when they began to tell me the story, he said, I knew they were telling the truth. That night, Jason was with another guy. One of them was drunk and one of them was on high on marijuana. As they're driving down the road in their car, they thought it would be really cool to turn the lights off and see how fast they could go. Now, you have to understand in this particular state, 
It's an agriculture state, and they've got roads every mile. Some are dirt and some are paved, but they're what we would call gun barrels. They don't turn. They just straight for miles. They were on one of those gun, gun barrels, more like a drag strip, and just going with the rise and fall of the land. And, and as they were speeding down that road, people who've heard this illustration who would know said, Preacher, they had to be going in excess of 100 miles an hour. They were speeding down the road. There was a Ford Bronco that came up to the road and was going to cross the road. And I was a husband, a wife, a little baby in the back seat. The husband looked both ways. He didn't see anything. Their headlights were off. So he began to pull slowly across the road. And when he did, the speeding pickup truck hit that car broadside. But it was going so fast, it turned the Ford Bronco into a ramp, launched the pickup truck into the air. The pickup truck turned around midair, came down on its hood. Jason's head was shoved under the dashboard. He was killed instantly. Aaron said, I went to the viewing. He said, I was shocked. The casket was opened. He says, I walked by the casket. He said, I could hardly recognize my friend. What had happened had misshapen his face. He didn't even look. I could hardly recognize him. But he said, this I did recognize. <laughs> Folded in a diamond neatly across Jason's chest was Jason's ACDC t-shirt. And Aaron remembered the countless time in each other's bedrooms. They had put on the record and screamed at the top of their lungs, I'm on my highway to hell. As he looked down in the face of his friend, he realized, Jason is there. And I never one time told him that Jesus saves. And although Aaron is a pastor and has been for years and has led other people to Jesus Christ, he lives with the constant reminder that his best friend is in hell. And he never told him one time. Could I ask every head bowed, please, and every eye closed? Do you know who you are, friends? You're the salt of the earth. You are the light. That's who you are. <laughs> to live anything other than that means you're not living. You're conformed to something who you not really are. That's not who you are. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Would you just stand to your feet right where you are? Stand to your feet. I know we're at the beginning. Be honest with you. Generally, my first message of a war of special forces, I don't give an invitation, but this is a little bit different here tonight. This is what I'm going to ask tonight. I'm going to ask just for the teenagers tonight. Now, of course, if a teenager responds and you want to pray with them, mom or dad or youth pastor, you're certainly welcome to. But this is for the young people. If God struck you tonight, you say, you know, preacher, that's who I am. But I'm, I'm conformed to something else. I'm not really living who I really am. <laughs> I've allowed myself to live in subpar of what God, who God says I really am. And God's dealing with me about that. The solution is not trying harder. The solution is believing it and then acting upon it. Heads about and eyes are closed. So if God's touched your heart, young people, I'm just going to invite you to come to the front and kneel. And first of all, say, God, I've been wrong. I've not been living what you say I am. But I'm here to say, God, I believe it. And uh, put a stake down in your life. That's who you are because you're in union with Jesus Christ. <laughs> Now, heads are bowed and eyes are closed. As the piano plays, teenager, if God's touched your heart, I want you to come right now to the, to the front and kneel. Would you do that? God's touched your heart. Just come right now. Right now to the front. God's not telling you to be the salt of the earth. He's not telling you to be the light of the world. He's telling you that that's who, what you are. So any failure is simply not living what God says who we are. It's, it's unbelief.
Praise the Lord. God is working in our hearts. Um, it's great to, uh, to see tenderness in people already. Um, young people, I want you to know this is the beginning of what God is doing. And if you are here tonight and you feel, you know what, I need, I need counsel, I need to talk to somebody now, um, I really do want to urge you, catch somebody as soon as we leave here. Don't get caught up in the energy and excitement of, of any other things that may be happening. Um, if there's something that you need to get off your chest and something you need to talk to, maybe your parents or a, a sponsor or someone else uh, here, we'd be more than happy to talk to you about that. Don't, don't put it off. Uh, there are going to be other opportunities to respond and to get, get help and counsel. Um, but if the Lord has worked in you, don't, don't put that off at all. Well, praise the Lord. This is a great start here tonight, and I know there's much more that God has for us as we continue on here this week. I want to say just a couple of things before we leave here tonight. Uh, just a reminder, if you're here and you have not yet registered, uh, as you were told in the video, don't be that guy, okay? Um, but uh, visit the registration table afterwards. Um, I believe there is a meeting for those who need to connect with sponsor, uh, with um, a lodging. Is that correct? I don't know where person would be that would know that. I think I heard something in the video about it being near the pianos, uh, but I could be wrong. Please speak up to correct me if that's not true, okay? Uh, so otherwise, uh, as soon as we're done here, uh, teenagers, we've got a special time over in the fellowship halls where you're going to um, connect with your squad, and uh, we've got some uh, a treat for you, some snacks, some, some sugar to fill your body so you can go to bed in a little bit. Um, <laughs> So you'll be nice and rested and relaxed for the rest of the week uh, for the rest of our competition. So uh, what I want to do here is I want to close in prayer. I'm also going to pray for those refreshments. Teenagers, if you could do this, unless you need to register, unless you need to connect uh, with your host. Again, I'm assuming that's what that is out there. Um, as soon as you're done with that, if you have already done those things and don't need to do that, you're going to head down this hallway over here uh, to a room that's called the Music Hall. You'll slip into the Music Hall grab the refreshment, and then go to the fellowship halls. There in the fellowship halls, if you, you should know what your squad is, uh, look for the table that has your squad name on it. Have a seat, and uh, we're going to have some fun things here tonight. Just to wrap things up, you'll get to meet your squad leader and a few other things as well. You'll have a, a meeting with your team captain also, a big meeting with your team, and uh, so make sure you connect uh, there with that. So we're very excited. Um, uh, adults, I do want to say something to you all, to you sponsors and parents. Um, I know you may not have gotten a booklet, uh, but we do have a schedule on the registration table, just a half sheet there that tells you what's going to be happening and when. Uh, that is also available on the Youth Summit page. If you scroll down to the details section and tap on schedule, uh, you'll see the same information on there in case you don't have that sheet there. Uh, but we want to make sure you know what's going on. Uh, breakfast Breakfast will be in the morning. We'll say more about that in the squad meeting here tonight. Uh, but let's go ahead and close in prayer. God in heaven, thank you so much uh, for the work that you're already doing in our midst. Thank you for those tender hearts. Uh, Lord, we want to be uh, all that you want us to be. We want to be what we are. And so, God, I pray, would you dig deep in our hearts and in our lives? Would you turn up the soil that is covering stuff that's hindering us, uh, that's causing us to fail, to be that salt and light uh, that we are in reality? And uh, Lord, would you just work in our hearts, leave no stone unturned, and uh, would you bring us to that true uh, total devotion to you? And uh, Lord, we praise you for the refreshments we're going to have. Would you bless them and our time here tonight in Jesus' name? Amen. All right, you're dismissed.